Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening, Friday, March 31st. I want to welcome you to our live Q&A here with Dr. Deborah Zelensky. Um, Deborah Zelensky OD is a founder of the Mina Institute. For the past 35 years, Dr. Zelensky's optometric practice has been devoted to the development of new methods of assessing brain function with emphasis on the often untested linkage between our eyes and ears. Her patented research in retinal processing and novel uses of retinal stimulation has been described in publication and courses worldwide. Dr. Glinsky's groundbreaking efforts in assessment of brain function are described in Clark Elliott, uh, Dr. Clark Elliott's uh, 2015 book, The Ghost in My Brain, How Concussions Stole My Life and How the science, New Science of Brain Plasticity Help me get it back. Dr. Zelensky also is known for her campaign to further the field of optometry from 20th century eye care to 21st century brain care. Dr. Zelensky is a reviewer of various optometric journals and also a fellow in both the College of Visual Development and the Neurooptometric Rehabilitation Association. She is a member of the American Optometric Association and is the newly elected president of the Society of Brain Mapping and Therapeutics the first optometrist to hold that position in the prestigious medical and research group. So once again, welcome everyone and welcome Dr. Slonsky. Thank you, Amara. <laughs> All right, we're ready to get started. A lot of you submitted your questions beforehand, thank you. So we're gonna go ahead and get started and answer your questions about today's topic, how a disrupted brain affects visual processing. Uh, visual processing disorders, uh, just for the audience, um, can be a real challenge for patients when it comes to accomplishing tasks in day-to-day -day life. And so today, Dr. Zelensky is going to be providing us more information about it. And um, folks that deal with symptoms like cortical visual impairment, seizures, strokes, and developmental delays, et cetera, et cetera. So first question for today's uh, Q&A is from Angela. My son is autistic and has uh, visual processing symptoms. Can you talk about services you offer that have helped autistic people? Um, that's a great question, Angela. Um, we, we deal with a lot of autistic people. Uh, what I have is a continuum that is like, as you know, the autistic spectrum is a large continuum. Uh, what I have is a continuum that goes from a, how the retina processes things. <clears throat> so the, the retina is the lining of the eye and it's an extension of brain tissue. So if you had your brain and you pulled a chunk of the brain forward, it would become the lining of the eye. It is your retina. So for autistic people, it typically the edges of the retina aren't activated. So they're unaware of what's going on around them to a point, and they're more aware of whatever target they, they choose to look at. So I've seen autistic people where if they've wanted a cookie and it's out of the corner of their eye, they just grab it. So they're using the corner of their eyes, but uh, very well, but not the same way that other people do. They don't link the, the edges of their eyes, the periphery with the center of their eyes. So they're shifting if they're into a pen light mode where they're just paying attention to one spot or a floodlight mode where everything pours in and they pick whatever they're interested in and they just grab. But the, the services we offer is to measure that continuum, how much they're using the central eyesight, how much they're using the peripheral eyesight and how adaptable they are to shift from one to the other. And what we're trying to do is find eyeglasses that would activate the retina to kind of turn on the parts that aren't normally on and mute the parts that are hypersensitive. So that, that's another aspect that we do at MindEye in addition to the muting and stimulating of the peripheral retina is to perceive, we measure how well the person processes sound location and how well they process target location when they see something. And if those two are skewed, which it's been found in autistic people, they are, we find glasses that would make the two perce perceived maps blend together properly. And so those are the two big things about our services that aren't typically covered 
uh, in a, a different kind of exam. The linkage of auditory and visual maps and the activation of peripheral sensors linking with central sensors. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Zlinski. And for those of you that are just joining us, feel free to leave a question in the comment thread, and we will be bringing those questions to Dr. Zelensky uh, for you to uh, get your answers. So the next question is from Penny. Can you please discuss anything that you know about how the damaged brain, how the damaged brain affects visual snow? Um, that's a good question too. Visual snow is a hot topic because there's more and more of it. Uh, there's some studies that show that up to 2% of the population experience it. And it's interesting because uh, some people believe, including me, that everybody has visual snow, but they mute it. Like you're just unaware of it. It's kind of like seeing your nose. We have people who say, I see my nose out of the corner of my eye and it bothers me. Well, everybody does, but they just forget about it. Or, you know, people have shoes and they can feel their feet in the shoes and they just ignore it all day long. So visual snow is something that uh, often occurs uh, after a brain injury. Uh, and it's often due to either inflammation or um, autonomic dysfunctions. Things that can make it be more uh, intolerable where it bothers people more, uh, can be anxiety or fatigue um, or severe inflammation. And what happens is that when you have this visual snow, the peripheral eyesight is just on overload all the time. And when people measure how you aim and focus consciously, those measurements are much smaller and less uh, flexible than typical. Uh, sometimes you can have uh, stomach issues also. And there's new studies now on something called the retina gut axis, where stomach issues can create retinal problems. Um, there's even a visual snow initiative uh, run by uh, uh, Charles Shudlovsky, who's uh, in Texas, and uh, Esther Hahn, who's in New York, and uh, a Dr. Tseng, who's in California. Um, the visual snow initiative is working on some sort of protocol uh, for visual snow. Um, but when you have a damaged brain, which is the question, uh, it, it just makes your awareness of your surroundings either hypersensitive or hyposensitive. And sometimes you're not able to filter out what you used to be able to filter out. I hope that answers you. That was a great, great answer. Um, so the next question comes from Lynn. Lynn wanted to know if we can address visual processing and how it affects the sympathetic nervous system. The more overload in outside stimuli, the more her brain can't take much, which leads to symptoms getting worse. She's been told that she needs cognitive behavior therapy because doctors tell her it's in her head and that she's faking it when she knows her condition is not psychological. She just wants to know if Dr. Z can shed some light on this topic to educate other doctors. Um, yeah, that, that's a funny question because we have so many patients where the doctors don't believe them. They have symptoms that are real and you know, doctors say, no, that can't happen. Um, first, I guess you have to know the difference between all of the different nervous systems. So the sympathetic one is nicknamed fight or flight. So people have heard of fight or flight. Uh, and it's got a counterpart called rest and digest. So they go in a teeter-totter. So if the rest and digest nervous system is turned on more, then you're nice and calm and you're digesting food. If the fight or flight nervous system is turned on more, then you're not digesting the food, food and you're not nice and calm, you're more tense. So when she asks about you know, how it affects the sympathetic nervous system, She's asking, how does it affect the fight or flight nervous system? And visual processing is a huge topic, which has many, many, many different components. So I can't answer your question directly because how visual processing affects sympathetic nervous system is too broad to, to deal with. But the relationship between them is if your visual processing is stressful or 
any aspect of visual processing is stressful, then your brain can get confused. And if your brain is confused, it will create stress chemicals and the stress chemicals will activate your fight or flight sympathetic nervous system. So it, there is a connection, but it's mostly based on how confused you are and how stressed you are. Um, trying to think if there's an easier way to say it. There's also, along with the rest and digest and the fight or flight, there's other systems that are internal. And that includes, they have one uh, from Steve Porges's books called Tend and Befriend. In other words, tend to yourself and befriend others for more social engagement to make you feel better. And then there's a gut uh, nervous system called the enteric nervous system. And all of those, uh, if any of them are stressed, it triggers sympathetic problems, it triggers the fight or flight. Thank you, Dr. Z. All right, our next question comes from Tom. Are, after the therapy with mind eye, could it reduce the occurrence of seizures or the susceptibility of having a seizure or increased seizure activity? Um, well, seizure activity is when there's an imbalance between something, between right and left, between the, like the, the chemical channels, the, uh, the axon potentials. So could, could the things that mind eye does reduce seizure activity? Yes, because we've had that in so many patients. Um, but so could other things. Uh, if, if, so I don't know if that's a, it's a quick answer. So the susceptibility of having a seizure uh, is tricky because there's so many different kinds of seizures and some come on with no warning. So you have focal seizures, global seizures. Um, you know, like. So the answer to his question is yes, what mind eye can do can often balance the sensory inputs and take away mismatches. And so that could help, but you can't promise anything. I'm going back to Lynn's question, just with the sympathetic things. When your fight or flight nervous system is on active, uh, when, it's, when it's front and center, then every single thing in your environment that moves can trigger a sympathetic reaction. So the example I often use is a mouse that's running around. It's not bothering you. The only sense it's, it's creating is your eye. It doesn't smell. It doesn't uh, come toward you. It's not um, making a noise, but it has a fast movement on the edge of your eye to startle you and trigger the sympathetic changes. So a mouse runs by, your retina gets a fast moving target, and your heart rate goes up, your adrenaline comes on, everything changes, that's your sympathetic reaction. And in people like Lynn was talking about, when there's visual processing problems, sometimes the edges of their retinas are so hypersensitive that everything that moves in their environment triggers that reaction of adrenaline and heart rate going up. And that's when, when the doctors say, oh, you know, you don't have this, they're not necessarily looking at how hypersensitive the retina is. Excellent, thank you. Our next question comes from Ashley. I was diagnosed with visual processing disorder and auditory processing disorder. I greatly struggle to read and retain what I'm reading. I also fall asleep every time I try, every time I try to read. Is there any way to work past this? This is what keeps me from going back to school. Well, that's a shame that something keeps you from going back to school when you want to do it. Um, this, you're, that's exactly what we do. I mean, every single thing you said, Amara, is, is um, exactly what we do here. We're looking at thinking ability, uh, limbic system functions, uh, brainstem functions, like for energy, for the fatigue, and then how those all link with sensory and motor skills. So yeah, what, what you just described is clearly what we do. Awesome. Okay. And then for our next question from Gina, can you explain how this applies to brain injury? I'm not sure. What, the I don't know visual what processing Gina, disorder. Oh, how, what the, this means. Visual processing. How does visual processing apply to brain injury? 
Yes. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what applies me. What I can tell you is that we split things into four segments. There's retinal processing, because as I said earlier, the retina is a piece of the brain. So it's an extension of brain tissue. So when light comes in, the retinas have to process information. And that information that gets processed is then whittled down into the optic nerves. So there's about 120-ish million signals in the ret in each retina, and there's about 1 million signals coming out of the each optic nerve. So you got 120 million inputs and 1.2 million outputs. And so all that retinal filtering happens first, that's one stage. Then the optic nerve sends signals into the brain and then once the further in the brain receives them, then you have processing done way beneath the conscious level. And that's how you like you organize. There's reflexes that happen. And then there's um, spatial awareness, time awareness that are beneath conscious level. Or as uh, one optometrist told me a few weeks ago, not only is it just subconscious, there's pre-conscious, which is part of the subconscious. And then you have conscious processing. So if your question is, can you explain how visual processing applies to brain injury? When your brain is injured, your processing is affected, but it could be at any one of those four levels, the retinal processing, the optic nerve processing, the subconscious processing, or the conscious processing. The, the optic nerves processing part they just send signals into spots in the brain, which link with other sensory systems. So that would be called sensory integration. So you have retinal processing, sensory integration, subconscious visual processing of like space and time, and then conscious visual processing. And any of those processing said centers can be disrupted by a brain injury. And depending on which one, you would have different sequela. So if you have the conscious visual processing disrupted, then you'll have trouble making decisions. If you have the subconscious processing, you'll have trouble with space and time, and you might have problems with your balance and walking. Um, if you have the uh, sensory integration processing disrupted, you're gonna have sensi sensory sensitivities. You know, you're gonna be bothered by smells and sights and sounds. And if you have the retinal processing disrupted, sometimes you can get dizzy or, you know, there, there's, so there's many different symptoms that go with each of those four aspects. So I hope that explains how one is applied to the other. All right. Thank you. For our next question comes from Betsy with permanent mm -hmm. brain damage that affects the visual processing area. Is there therapy? Can this disability ever disappear? There's lots of visual processing areas, so I'm not you know, sure which one she's talking about. Um, you can always develop new skills. You know, for instance, blind people can uh, visualize through sounds. You know, it's a totally new skill. Uh, Paul Baki Rita's work in the 90s on sensory substitution uh, showed that um, in the brain port, uh, which is now called the PONS, it has a stimulator for the tongue. And you can have tongue stimulation that triggers visual processing. So I'm not quite sure when you say permanent brain damage that affects visual processing. If you mean visual eyesight, you know, in the visual cortex and, that, and there's damage, you can have sensory substitution uh, instead, but I'm not sure what she means with saying visual processing area because visual processing is so it's such a huge topic it, it encompasses tons and tons and tons of different areas excellent okay our next question comes from nancy uh do you know of anything to help and if i pronounce this wrong i apologize oscillopsia oh oscillopsia yeah um Oscillopsia is when you kind of see the floor moving or things, objects moving. It's an unstable retinal image. So there's four main components for that. There's your eye itself. Then there's your inner ear for your head position. And then there's two sets of neck muscles. There's the voluntary set that moves your head around. Um, 
like there's your cervical uh, vertebrae and all the muscles around them. And then you have uh, deeper muscles in the neck that make your chin go up and down. Um, and there's reflexes between your eyes and your inner ear, between your inner ear and those deep muscles, between the inner ear and the neck, the regular neck muscles. Um, and all those different reflexes have to work together so that the image is clear and stable on the retina. If any of them are not working right, then you can, you can experience oscillopsia. Um, so there are practitioners. We here work with something called the Movement Guild in Chicago. And there's a doctor named Adam Wolf, who's a physical therapist. And he's doing some great work with oscillopsia because I've referred him to patients with that and he's uh, solved both of their problems. So I would try the, the, um, the Movement Guild for that. Um, you have the eyes with respect to the head, then you have the head with respect to the body, then you have the body with respect to gravity, and then you have your head rotation while your trunk is stable. So that there's, there's all different ways that people use their eyes and head to, and trunk together. And if any of those reflexes is disrupted, you just gotta learn, uh, you have to learn new ways to do things. Excellent. All right. For our next question uh, from Ron, my son suffered a TBI, diffuse axonal. And when he was 17, currently 41 years old, he currently is in a wheelchair and requires 24 seven care, mostly because of the physical deficits he suffered as a result of the injury. Um, his vision has been compromised, chronic dry eyes, double vision, blepharospasm, glaucoma suspect, also severe muscle tone, included holding his head down and to the left. He was wondering how much his compromised vision plays into his head control and positioning. Um, so having, having a brain injury for 24 years from age 17 to 41 is, a, is, is hard because a lot of habits are ingrained. Um, it sounds, I don't hear from uh, Ron's statement, whether or not uh, there's cognition still. It, 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 some people uh, have good cognitive skills, but poor motor skills. And other people have poor cognitive and motor skills. So depending on which that is, uh, the, the solution or the help would be different. Um, but as far as, you know, you know what would be you know, how the compromised eyesight would play into the head control, you'd still have the muscles we just talked about. In addition, you'd have the inner ear as well as the neck muscles and the eyes. Um, if he's a glaucoma suspect, that means that there might be some nerve damage more in one eye than the other. So when you're looking at the optic nerve signaling, one eye is going to send different signals from the other. Uh, the latency will be different in the when light comes in. Uh, so this is the type of thing that would need a thorough evaluation. So the answer to that would be, uh, I don't know how much of his compromised vision plays a role, but I also don't know whether or not he it, did somebody put glasses on him that are meant for 20 feet away, like the glasses he had before his injury. Uh, because if you're putting glasses on to stimulate his central eyesight for a 20 foot distance, and he's in a wheelchair and he's got his head down and his world is three feet away, uh, he might just need a pair of glasses designed for three feet away instead. But it, it just sounds like that would need a fuller evaluation before I could make any claims or, or statements. All right, for our next question. This question comes from Agnes. She has a few questions here. Um, one, I have terrible dry eyes since I fell. Me taking, now I'm taking cyclosporine eye drops, which helps a little. My eyes get so fatigued. I have to stop and put a warm compress on them for 45 minutes. Is there anything I can do to help that? Sometimes the diet makes a difference. Um, and there's, and the, the way that the tear, the, on the, the, the tears that coat your eye are kind of like a sandwich where there's water in the middle and there's uh, mucus that sits up against the eye and then kind of oil on the front surface. 
So if the oily layer is not good or the mucus layer is not good, then it's like a sandwich, the middle falls out and the, 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 your eyes can get watery. They're not cushioning the eyes and you get a dry eye, scratchy feeling. So you have to figure out whether the oily part or the mucus part is having the problem. And there's different things in your diet that can help that. Um, a, she said she's doing um, different compresses. Sometimes the pores in your eyelids can get um, clogged up. They're supposed to be creating kind of a baby oil um, substance that coats your eye. And if the pores are clogged up, you're not able to produce this substance. It won't come out uh, because the pores are clogged. And so in that case, there's something called Blefex, which is a treatment that some optometrists do. It looks like a little electric toothbrush and it, it goes along the edges of the eyelashes to unclog the pores. So that's something she could do. Um, I, I hope that helps. Absolutely. You know, I'm just right. thinking the, the one man you said earlier where he had the son that was 17 and now he's 41. Uh, it seems like that's, you know, 24 years is a long time, but we've had people for decades that, you know, all of a sudden can learn to use their brain a different way. So brains are pretty neat because they, they can be molded and changed at any level. Uh, it's just harder to break an older habit, but they can be done. Depends on the attitude of the patient, which is why I wanted to know if there's cognitive ability or not. So. Got it. And then for Agnes, uh, her second question was, I do a brain HQ app of iron exercises. I tried doing them three times a week for 30 minutes, but it was too difficult. Sometimes even five minutes. My eyes are too much. Are these exercises good? I think they are for me, except I have such brain issues after I do them for a few days. Now I try five minutes at a time. How do I get myself beyond that? Um, the exercises, if you're saying they feel good or they are good for you, um, but it's too much and your eyes get fatigued and your brain gets fatigued, uh, you might need to be a smaller amount of time. So even two minutes. And see. So what we do with everybody is they have to find their level of comfort. So it, her, it sounds like her level of comfort is less than five minutes. Otherwise, she wouldn't have the problems a couple of days later. So pick whatever your tolerance range is. Go smaller than it so you're in your comfort range and work at that level. So do your exercises two minutes or three minutes at a time um, and slowly work your way up and see if the activities, whatever exercises you're talking about, if they can be applicable toward your everyday life. So for instance, if you just move your eyes around, but you're not equating it to, you know, shifting from a television to a person to, you know, a book, then it can become something called a splinter skill where you learn a skill, but it doesn't apply to your everyday life. So Got stay it. within your comfort range. Great advice. And number three, I had cataract surgery two years ago and I chose to get the same distant vision in both eyes. The cataracts, wonderful, improved my vision greatly. However, I'm always having a problem when it comes to reading small print. Could that be screwing up my brain? Should have gotten a distance lens in one eye and reading in the other. No, you did the right thing by getting the two distance lenses. Um, if you have a distance in one eye and a reading in the other eye, you're always rotating your head. So in order to read, you'd rotate. So this eye's centered to see far, you'd rotate the other way. So you're way better, but you would need a reader on top of it. You need some glass on top of the implants in order to read. Um, you can get one that you just stick on every time you want to read, or you can get one in a bifocal form where the top part is zero and the bottom part has a reading so that you can just leave it on your nose. Um, but that's, you're just describing really normal things from having cataract surgery. Awesome. All right. And next question comes from Chris. My question is that if I feel that my audio processing and if incapacity to process multiple streams of input, being able to keep up the conversations and keeping thought streams intact are more of what I battle with on a daily basis. Will a therapy focus on the visual processing have the impact needed to help reboot my brain? I don't know about rebooting your brain. Uh, 
in the for audio streams, it's like if you're saying that you can't have multiple streams of input through your ears, like if um, background noises bother you and you can't tune them out, uh, then there are activities that you could do. You can, um, we use like a radio as well as a television or you now, nowadays you can use a, like a computer versus a television and you turn one louder and one softer and you, you listen to the loud one and you just have the soft one in the background and you find what level you can tolerate it at. So if you have a news show, let's say, and you're trying to listen to the news, but a child's toy is you know, playing in the background, but it's muted, can you still follow the news show? And then you slowly, slowly, slowly bring the volume up of the other thing, of the distraction, and you still try to localize the sound. Uh, so it's, it's a learned skill. And if you've had a brain injury, you still can learn it. Uh, it's just hard. But I would work um, on auditory localization first. Uh, one way we do that with children is we have the parents hide a telephone, a cell phone anywhere in their house like behind a pillow uh, in their living room and then they call it and then have the child try to zoom, you know, go straight for it and see if they can find where it is just by listening. If you build that skill, then you would be able to, um, if you were to build up that skill, you would be able to slowly tune out the background noises. Got it. All right. So Chris, I hope that answered your question. Teresa's, I got the next question. I have a TBI and struggle with fatigue and memory, as well as learning and cognition in general. Sometimes I feel a flash of how I felt before the accident where I hit the back side of my head, right side of the occipital lobe, but it never stays for long and I struggle with energy. I have a numbness on the left side of my head, especially around the left eye area. And I feel like my sight has been compromised, even if I score well on a standard eye test with a Snellen chart. I've thankfully learned a lot about this from Dr. Z and also from reading Clark Elliott's book. The last few weeks, I have tried to use binaural beats a lot because I feel like this activates the left side. I have felt tingling and an activation that changes and moves. This has given me hope that binaural beats may be healing. I have not found a lot of research on this, but there's a case study where subjects with uh, MTBI have used binaural beats and that this has had statistically effect on the recovery. I wonder if you at Mind Eye Institute use this or have any knowledge on this. The theory is that the beats are activating on the corpus callosum and that this creates more coherence in the brain as the two sides work better together. Also, the beats can ease anxiety and stressful emotions and may cause, may create a better environment for healing because of that. Does that make sense for you at Mind Eye? Um. It does, um, but you can also have it poorly. I have one patient who used binaural beats and they, she did them too much, too loud and too often and threw her whole recovery off. So everything in moderation is very good. Uh, so I, I strongly believe in the whole concept of binaural beats uh, if it's done with somebody who's uh, monitoring it <laughs> at the right levels. Um, it's it's definitely uh, a good thing, but it's, it's just another way to get to your brain. It's a sensory input, just like your eyes are a sensory input and it's balancing right and left. So it's, it's great. Um, so are other sensory inputs. I mean, my last 30 years has been designed around how auditory and visual processing have to link. So binaural beats, um, you know, works in harmony with, uh, uh, with what visual things you can do. But it's definitely got to be with the right practitioner. Got it. Okay, so for those of you that are leaving your questions in or on the Facebook uh, live here, I'm going to go ahead and answer your questions. That just concludes the email questions that we received beforehand. We may not get to all of your questions, but that's okay. We only have about 19 minutes left uh, until we um, we shut down here, but I'm going to try to answer as many, try to get as many of your questions answered as possible. So first we have a question from Anita. Are remote visual and auditory assessment, are remote visual and auditory assessments, or are they only effective in person? 
Well, that's a good question. We've done remote visual assessments. Um, it's we've done them with other optometrists who have been measuring things to just do things in your house to say, how do you see and how do you hear? That's only one part of the picture. Um, so when you say are they eff they're effective, but not as much as in person. Got and it. It, depends on, and it depends on what's going on, if it's a, a level two or a level three person. In other words, did you used to have good auditory and visual processing and then something disrupted it? Or were you never very good and you haven't learned it? Um, it, it either way, yes, you can do something remotely, uh, but it won't be, we, we would only be able to see which pathways were had a problem and maybe how to uh, to learn new pathways, but it's not going to be able to check to see what eyeglasses you would need to give your brain direct stimulation. Awesome. All right. And so our next question from Facebook, Michelle asks, how do you work with those with learning disorders and or dyslexia? Um, we do what we said earlier, there's the four groupings. We evaluate retinal processing, we evaluate sensory integration, we evaluate subconscious visual processing and conscious visual processing. And then depending on where there's a glitch, we would typically use eyeglasses from the outside to equalize the right and left sides and processing. Uh, and then we would use uh, visual learning activities in order to develop internal visualization. So for instance, somebody with a learning disorder uh, or dyslexia, if they can't read, but they can listen to a story. We had a dyslexic the other day, tell him a story. He had this in his head. He could talk about it. Great. Put it in the ears, but make him read three sentences. Can't do it. They don't make any sense. The words get jumbled up. So how do we work with that? we have to build internally the pathway of converting a word into a picture. Um, so with all different types of learning disorders and or dyslexia, there's many different pathways to assess. Once we figure out which pathway is the weaker one, we can build that up. Brains can change. That's, that's the fun part about working with brains is they're always changeable the whole concept of neuroplasticity. All right. And the next question is for Michelle. Another Michelle. How successful is the treatment for someone who has struggled with visual processing and auditory processing since childhood and is now 30? That's easier because then you get a willing participant. The, the, uh, the four A's we talk about, the attention and awareness can be taught but the part that she's talking about, the attitude where she wants to get better, the attitude and the adaptability, those are the key factors that, that usually makes or breaks the, the treatment type things. So um, how do we, how successful is it when you have the person with the right attitude and they want to go through it, then I, I don't think the brain has that many limits. You can always learn something new. Excellent. Terry. How do you test to determine what complications or brain misfires are occurring in a nonverbal autistic child? Oh, that's a really good question because we have them all the time. Uh, we have a pupil tester where you shine a light into the nonverbal person's eyes and it measures how the signals go in one eye and compared to how they go in the other eye. And it'll measure how fast the pupil constricts when light comes in. How, how fast it constricts, how small it gets, how, how uh, the speed that it goes back to normal. And all of that is compared between the two eyes. So if you have a child where uh, the right system constricts really fast and then is stuck and the left system constricts at an average rate but then goes back average, it's telling you how the brain is processing uh, the information coming in. And then we can use glasses to modify it. You, can, you can't speed up the bad one, but you can slow down the good one. So if you make them even, then the child is getting equal information and can judge what's going on around them more accurately. Um, that's one of the things we do. 
And then other nonverbal autistic children, we have my Z-Bell test that's patented where um, they have to reach for a bell to see where it's located. And we, they, we don't have problems. Most of the nonverbal autistic children can do that. They reach around um, and we put different glasses on to see which ones help them locate the sounds better. And another way we test them is by shining a light inside their eye. You're actually looking at brain activity. So when we shine the light, we're looking at blood flow. The more the child is engaged in the environment, the more neurological activity there is and the more blood flow there will be to nourish the neurons that are doing their job. So we can look and say, ha, if we put this lens in front of somebody, then wow, there's a lot of neurological activity. They're engaged in the environment. We put a different lens in front of them and they're not engaged in the environment. So on a nonverbal autistic child, we'll be checking to see where do we have to wake up their brain and where is it already awakened? Excellent. All right, next question from Megan. Uh, can you comment on the dyslexic brain and mind-eye support? And what support? Um, mind-eye support, like uh, how mind-eye supports people with you know, dyslexia. Yeah. I mean, I want my legacy to be where I, like the Lex dyslexia is eliminated, just like polio was eliminated. Um, so dyslexia, the more and more research that's done, it's a language-based problem, but the research is showing that it's a problem with auditory and visual systems not being in sync with each other. So I think that when you get them in sync with each other, and then you build skills that the person never got and originally that you can work with dyslexia. Excellent. All right, so Molly. Hi, I didn't answer my question earlier. But my son has a brain injury from a craniotomy to, to debulk a supracellar brain tumor when he was two. He had no perceivable vision issues before the surgery and was neurotypical. After surgery, we were told the endocrine issues he has would be transient from inf inflammation by the pituitary and hypothalamus. How are they remain but fluctuate? Can you talk about the retina endocrine hypothalamus connection? Uh, sure. That was the, as I said earlier, the retina itself is a chunk of brain tissue. We got it. So the brain is here and the eyeballs are here and the eyes are an extension of the brain and the lining of them, the retina does, as I said earlier, about 126 million receptors that respond to light. So all of that's filtered into 1.2 million signals that leave through the optic nerve to go further in the brain. And of that 1.2 million signals, some of them go straight to the hypothalamus. So when you change light that goes into the retina, you're altering the signals that are going into the hypothalamus. Um, so that's the connection that she's asking about. Um, when they, when her question is, can you know, we talk about a retina endocrine hypothalamus connection? Um, the hypothalamus is only one of many glands in the body. So when she's talking about endocrine connection, the, the endocrine system has lots and lots of different glands. Uh, I'm actually reading up now on glucose metabolism, which would be more dealing with the pancreas, which is another gland in the endocrine system and how retinal stimulation is affecting that. Um, but you have, you know, parathyroid glands, thyroid glands, like there's a lot of glands. Um, so I'm not sure what she wants me to talk about, but the, the hypothalamus has a lot of different functions. It's got, it does appetite, mood, um, many, many different things. Um, so when you put different glasses on, and you alter the autonomic functions as well as the endocrine functions, and then they balance, and then the limbic functions, um, you, can, you can affect everything. So the optic nerve signals, some of them are used for limbic functions, some are used for endocrine functions, some are used for autonomic functions, some deal with skeletal muscles, 
and some deal with thinking. Um, I, I'm not quite sure when she says talk about the retina, it's about all I can say. I mean, we change the retinal input and it changes all that other stuff. Got it. Okay. For Kristen, mm -hmm. she writes, shaken as a toddler plus six concussions. 20 years later, another two concussions in the last four years. Mm -hmm. My sight's a wreck and without prison glasses, what can I do? I'm 46. She's 46. So she was shaking as a toddler, had six concussions, and then two more concussions. Wow. Um, well, when she says the eyesight is a wreck without the prism glasses. With and without, sorry, just to clarify. Oh, with and without. Well, maybe she, if, if the eyesight is a wreck either with or without prism glasses, then maybe she doesn't need the prism. Prisms only do one thing. Well, prisms bend light as do lenses. But if the prisms glasses are not helping you because they're with or without, then there's many other ways to be helped. The prism glasses work on skeletal muscles, but you might want to work on visceral muscles. And you would do that through various tints or possibly through filters blocking off different spots on the glasses. So if there's one particular spot in your brain that's, that's really damaged, there's a corresponding spot in your retina. And if you block it off with a, an occlusion foil, then the signals won't go there and you might feel more comfortable. That's something that we'd have to analyze and evaluate very specifically. But when we get people who say prism glasses didn't help, then we don't use prism glasses, we use other things. Got it. And sometimes um, it's a balance between the right and the left, and sometimes it's a balance between peripheral and central. There's a lot of things we can measure. Got it. All right, so if I have stomach issues and suddenly have major focal issues with my eyes, can mind eye help? If they have stomach issues and what? suddenly are having major focal issues with their eyes. Oh, um, yeah, that's that's what I was talking about earlier. Re you should uh, Google retina gut axis or gut retina and uh, read about that. It, that um, you, you change how your gut and your, it's called a gut microbiome and you change that and then the eye issues often go away. Yeah, Google, you could probably, you could Google retina gut axis or you could Google gut microbiome biome and retina. Got it. Okay. Um, how often do, this is from Amy, how often do those experiencing visual problems following a mild TBI improve, not improve, following their optometric re rehabilitation therapy? It depends on their attitude. Uh, so with the people who have the right attitude who want to get better, uh, it's an enormous, uh, overwhelming majority improve. Uh, the people who don't have the attitude, who've been dragged in by some loved one, uh, don't necessarily improve. So attitude and adaptability are key components. Um, just like a diet, you know, how many, you know, how successful is a diet? Well, it depends if the person does what they're supposed to do. So it's the same with the visual processing. So, so the question, how often? you know, really often, almost, you know, close to 100% if the patient's a willing participant. Okay. Next we have, we only have about five more minutes, so if we don't get to your question, um, please join us for the next Q&A. Uh, Michelle asks, if I'm seeing a white black shape that comes and goes once or twice a week with both eyes and it appears in the same place, just to the left or whether, whatever I'm focusing on, is that an eye thing or a brain thing? If it's in each eye, she covers one eye and it's still there, and she covers the other eye and it's still there, then it's a brain thing. Got it. Simple. Okay. Um, from Leah, how do you know if you are dizzy from because an eye issue or ear issue, suffering since a concussion a year ago? Uh, you'd have to be assessed. Uh, I assume that if you had a problem and you you, you can have your eyes checked and your ears check separately, and it might not be either issue, it might be the combination of them and how your brain processes it. That's the type of thing we'd have to look at. All righty. Uh, the next question we have here is, Louise, are there exercises 
for slow visual processing to help it get back to normal. Um, that's that's Louise Mathusen, who's uh, an incredible author. Somebody should look up her website. Um, so if visual processing is slow, then uh, you have to figure out what aspect of visual. It's the same as the other question. Visual processing is a giant topic. That's like saying math. Well, you know, math is, there's algebra and calculus and geometry. There's many, many different things. So if your visual processing is slow, do you mean that you can't scan easily? Do you mean you can't shift your eyes? Do you mean you can't fixate on something? Do you mean you can't comprehend what you're looking at? So there's too many questions to answer. Um, but if, it, if, if whatever topic you think is slow, can you improve it? The answer is yes. First, you have to figure out what it is that's slow and then build skills around it and then practice and make that better. Um, but Louise is one who said that TBI is her quote, uh, instead of being traumatic brain injury is transformed by injury. And that's in her book and on her website. And I think that's one of the neatest things I've read in 40 years, um, because that's what all these patients are. They're transformed by their injury into new people and they have to adapt. That's why I said the attitude and the adaptability is the most important thing. Got it. All right. Next question. Uh, Mariana, and this will be our last question uh, for Mariana. Hi, Dr. Z. Can you explain about a per about persons who demonstrate visual perceptual de deficits and if how that impacts development of motor midline orientation? Wait, visual perceptual deficits and how it affects motor midline. Is that what you said? Orientation, correct. Orientation. So in your head, you have a map a mental map of what's going on around you. And so you have your midline orientation that way. If, you're, if you have a visual processing deficit of space, a spatial deficit, then, and you perceive things as bigger on one side and smaller on another, or farther on one side and closer on another, then that's gonna shift your perceived midline, but not necessarily your actual midline. So you're gonna have a midline shift syndrome. I think that's what you're asking but and as far as development of a motor midline you know if, if you're trying to reach across to get something if you have a functional midline shift then you're going to have a bigger chunk of space on one side in your mind and a smaller chunk on the other that's going to make you rotate your body all righty and i think i have time for one or two more questions um let's see here um If someone doesn't have any injury but has audio, audio processing and is 15 years old, would mm -hmm. glasses provided by or mind eye treatment help someone oh, like that? Most, from Maria. Most, yeah, most often, yes, because the you haven't told me whether the 15 year old has a difference between peripheral processing in the right eye versus the left eye. If, if you have differences in the two sides of the visual circuits, it's gonna affect where you perceive auditory stimuli. So that's what we see all the time. This is what I started way back in 1992, where we'd have people learning and they wouldn't be able to listen to the teachers really well. And we put different glasses on them and they could all of a sudden hear the teachers speaking more slowly, uh, clearly, and they were able to take notes e more easily. So yeah, that's exactly what we would we would work with. And that, those are the easier cases because they're normal people who haven't yet been disrupted. They just didn't develop the skill. Got it. Okay. And that's about all the time we have for today. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Z. Um, and for those of you that uh, maybe joined us a little bit late, or if you haven't been in the chat long or didn't get your question answered, feel free to reach out to one of our new patient advocates. If you look in the chat, there is a message pinned as a comment. Uh, if you go ahead and fill out that form, you can speak to one of our new patient advocates and they can help answer any questions that you might have about uh, getting treatment at the Mind Eye Institute and help you set up an appointment. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Zielinski, for answering all of the questions that were asked today. Uh, did you want to say anything else in closing about how the Mind Institute supports 
uh, people with uh, visual processing disorders? Uh, yeah, and there's one question that uh, from a 71 year old artist that talks about when she blocks each eye separately, the movement that she's perceiving stops. Uh, that's somebody who can try uh, selectively trying with your fingers, going like this, seeing if blocking off part of the the eye sight also does that. It doesn't have to be completely covering an eye. Um, Mind Eye Institute itself has been working with visual processing for decades. And uh, our goal is to help people be more comfortable. We, we come into work every day saying, how many people's lives are we going to change today? And it's pretty fun. Awesome. Well, thank you all. We're going to go ahead and wrap up again. Please uh, fill out the form pinned in the comments to speak to one of our new patient advocates. And as always, feel free to reach out. Our phone number is on our website at mindeye.com. And feel free to reach out to us if you need anything at else. Thank you for joining us this evening. We'll be back with more information. Please be on the lookout uh, in your email and on our social networks. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, Amara, for your time. <laughs>